This is part of our conference that's also near and dear to our heart called the Firestarter portion of the program. And every year, this is our fifth year of this program where we ask you, our global members, who you know that deserves our world promotion. Companies that are new technology companies or existing companies with new technology that are potentially world improving, that have something to say, that deserve our connections. And we have, we're really pleased to have two sessions here, Firestarters 1 and Firestarters 2. And we're very honored to also have the BBC as our partner in this, who always entertains us with the uh, scintillating interviews of our Firestarters. Thank you. Scintillating. Uh, good morning. Five people. I've spoken to a few of them. I don't understand a word they're talking about, but uh, these are very bright people. Let me get, the, get you to introduce yourselves one by one, if you would. Just. I'm Stephen Sprague, Wave Systems. Paul Plushkel, founder of Spigot. Alpha Train, BEA Systems. Mike Berman, Finsphere. Andre Rufuskos, and Venio Biosystems. Fantastic. Uh, Stephen, take it away. Uh, tell us a bit about uh, what you're doing with Wave Systems. Sure. Wave Systems is a software company. We support new um, hardware security in the PC platform. You heard a little bit about it yesterday from Intel. Um, we say new because most people don't understand it's there. There are just under um, 450 million PCs by the end of this year that have trusted platform modules on the motherboard. Um, this is hardware security that's designed to uh, both provide support for the integrity and health of the platform uh, as well as identity. So we believe in the future you will um, be able to log into your machine with a simple PIN number like you do with your phone today and then have all the keys that log you into all the different services to which you belong um, really stored and secured by your device. And so it's a device-centric model to authentication of the world. So we believe this is the foundation for subscriber management for all of your cloud services. It starts in a simple way day one with how do I secure the enterprise. And if you look at the trusted computing standards body, it's um, it's chaired by the major manufacturers uh, and, and really provides very <coughs> solid standards for hardware security in the box. This is getting back to the real foundation of what makes security real. You all know what it is. If anybody's had or has a BlackBerry, the fact that you've registered your phone with the BlackBerry Enterprise Service and it has a key that's stored in a tamper-resistant credential vault in the phone, that's what's securing the relationship between the phone and the service. And in many aspects, it's the part that Apple and Android forgot. And so we don't have an adequate credential store in the, in the smartphone space. And I think it's going to be one of the really interesting challenges is to backfill that space. And so with almost a half a billion PCs, we think it's a very interesting opportunity to have the fundamental tools for hardware security built in. And we're pleased to be one of the leading software vendors in the space. Now, you've been chosen as a, as a world-improving business. In what way? Would you say that this is a, a world improving uh, I, concept? I think if we could be, if, if we could ultimately achieve the greatest success, it will be that we eliminate your need for passwords. And, and I think that most people would agree that that would be a great improvement. <laughs> um, the, the reality today is that we as humans are extremely bad at adhering to policy, following the rules. Um, this has been true since we were like this tall, right? <laughs> and, and, and that's the challenge is, um, you know, please come up with yet another 16 character upper and lower case, preferably with obscure symbols password, we're really bad at. And so we need access ramps. We need, we need the tools to help us poor handicapped people who can't figure out how to manage this authentication. And so these are the tools to accomplish that. But doesn't everybody just use the same word for every password? Or am I just... Generally, that's perceived to be a pretty bad idea. <laughs> oh. Um, but we all do. And, and, that's, and, and so how do we make it easier? And, and this is about convenience. Security is underpinning it. But um, I like to use the example of, for example, a garage door. You know, n we all like an automatic garage door opener. The byproduct was security. Before your garage door opener, we used to leave it all unlocked, and your neighbor would borrow your lawnmower. After you bought an electric garage door opener, when you push the button, it locks the door. We didn't buy it for locking the door. We bought it because we didn't want to get out of the car in the rain. And, and I think that the same context is true here as well. You need to live in a better neighborhood. That's all I can say. Uh. But anyway, but, but that, that, that's fantastic. Let's move on. Hear a little bit from you, sir. Great. Spigot is all about purpose-built social innovation software. 
Um, if your company, uh, all, all companies have strategic objectives. And the idea is, going back to Bill's speech, is to create better efficiency. So what we want to do is we want to align all of your employees, your customers, and your partners collectively to achieve those objectives and drive real business results. So we like to say that we take crowds and we turn them into engaged communities that really deliver on results. And I, I think some of the best ways to look at it, it can be platform agnostic, it can be on Facebook, it can be on SharePoint, it can be our own Java platform. But the idea is, a, a good example, New York City has 300,000 residents, or employees rather, 10 million residents. And the 300,000 employees are on Spigot right now, and they had three challenges uh, addressed to them, which were real strategic objectives of the mayor's office. The first was, how do we get people to stop drinking bottled water and go to tap water? New York's known to, uh, for, for quality tap water. Um, it also has um, um, environmental issues as well. The next was, how do we get New York City um, to stop using all the paper because of uh, more environmental issues? And finally, how do we get um, the hold times down and wait for customers? What better way is there to solve a problem at those scales than to engage your edge and bring that edge information back to the core? And that's what Spigot's about. It's this collective knowledge, but not just based on popular opinion. It's really about efficient trading markets as well. As ideas graduate through the system, they actually IPO. And people, through their currency that they earn, actually trade in ideas. That's a very efficient market that gets the leading results. And we did something with John Chambers on the iPrize, where they had thousands and thousands of ideas submitted. Our software, over three months, got to the top ten ideas. The idea was Cisco was looking for the next billion-dollar idea to change um, their product category. They took the top ten ideas. They went around an executive roundtable to pick the top three. John Chambers went on stage in Vegas, announced the winner. And um, interestingly enough, the top three that the executive team chose were in the exact order that our software chose. So it's becoming quite a science. Um, we took this technology out of the financial markets. We built algorithmic trading models for buy and sell side firms and applied it to social networking conversations. So it's not just about connecting in social network, but it's really gaining in efficiencies and tapping that collective knowledge. Um, we're, we're using 25% of our employees' talent. You know, I have community managers that are molecular biologists. If I'm trying to solve a problem outside of that domain, I would really like to be able to tap into that. And, and we're all creatures of habit. We like to go where our passions lie. We have much more knowledge than our job title. We're much broader. So I think there's so much efficiency to be gained inside the workforce today and then expanding out to your customers by just using the tools that are available today. As a CEO, it used to be my job to help make decisions. It's my job now to get the technology to people that can make the right decisions. And a world-improving business, it sounds like that. But Most uh, in, what, uh, in what particular way would you say? Um, well, I, I think, again, is that as we get into this next, um, you know, the knowledge worker side, um, people are coming to work with far more uh, uh, capabilities by, by using technology to their advance. And if we're able to collectively take this, if, if my biggest expense is my employees, and I can tap and get 25% more or 75% more productivity out of those employees or knowledge. How many um, do you have? Well, Spigot today is 120. Um, but, but we service, you know, Walmart has 2 million. Um, they, they had an exp, um, a Spigot instance where it generated $90 million in profits in the fourth quarter of 2009. One of the store managers of Sam's Club actually had an idea how to generate profits. In his region, people um, couldn't afford the, the yearly subscription. So they took a $10 card for 10 days, which generated $90 million. Pfizer has a video on our site where they're reducing the time to market a drug from 12 years to 10 years by using our technology. So these are world-changing improvements that are um, because of our software. Paul, thank you very much. Alfred, let's hear from you. Oh, good morning. Um, what Magnus is about is completely changing enterprise software again. So for those of you who have actually used enterprise software, we went from the 60s and 70s on the mainframe to client server, uh, which is the relational database-based applications, to distributed, then to the web, which the web went on fire in the late 90s to the early 2000s. And all the applications that we access from the banks, from the telcos, from whoever we are doing business with is now on the web, to now to a services-driven application paradigm, and then it kind of stopped. So uh, our goal is to reinvent the whole model again. Uh, there are several things that uh, we are uh, we're implementing our technology with and on that's helping us, which there's a lot of momentum. One is on the top is a social computing-based model. So today, most of the social computing stuff we use at home with the consumer, but when we get to work, it's all old stuff. We're filling our form, pushing a button and submit the form. So it's not really, not let alone interactive. They really have no bearing about we working with a bunch of colleagues, we're working with our customers, we're working with subcontractors getting something done. <coughs> Majority of our data are still tracked in a very structured format, but 
most of the data that we're using, our own structure, is in the documents, is in the video, is in the voice recording, is in archives, is in many different forms. So structuring those, linking them, making workflow out of them, and be able to replicate them and be able to reuse them the next time, very critical. So there are huge implications to things like searching, um, binding a transaction. This is a binding contract we're doing based on a bunch of unstructured data. Those are all kinds of stuff. The second wave that we're taking advantage of is clearly the public cloud. So today, most of the applications in large IT organizations, you know, your phone companies, uh, your banks, your airlines, really all run in-house. Humongous amount of waste, very long deployment time as people have to gear up of how these apps get de uh, deployed. <coughs> in our environment, from the development to the deployment, everything is on the cloud. Now, it's our job to make it secure, very full <coughs> tolerance. You can fail over to different types of clouds as you build the application. So these are all things that you'll be pre-built into the enterprise applications itself. So for the purpose of illustrations and also um, to show the world how these new generation apps work, we have built an application called SalesWin. It's on the market now. You go to www.magnet.com. You can see, touch, use this application. Individual users can use it for free. It, you know, the great internet paradigm. And uh, we soon will have a mobile version of the product as well. So only one company needs to come in with a team of people to manage an opportunity, then we ask our clients to pay. So we're reinventing not only the model, the way the thing should be built, no perpetual licenses, everything is pay as you go down to the transaction level. So that's really what Magnus is about. And you've done some interesting things in the past, haven't you? Tell me about uh, your previous business. Well, um, I've gotten very lucky. You know, the gentleman was up here before, um, uh, Bill Janeway, have funded a company that we have built uh, in the 90s called BEA System. BEA was sold to Oracle in 2008. And um, it's, a, it's what we call a middleware company, the term that we invented in, the in 1995, which is a enabling, distributed computing enabling company. This is kind of, we saw how the world demarked from just client server to having the capacity to run on a variety of virtualized server hence replacing the mainframe altogether. So it ran all the most mission critical application we have today. So all the topics that we talked about from military to um, the banking systems to every text messages to every number that provisions ran on technology that you had built you know, over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. I had a grand time doing that. That was terrific. Yeah. I'm sure you did. And returned a lot of money back to um, uh, Bill, so I was, I was happy. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure he is too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Mike, let's hear from you. Yeah, FinSphere, um, FinSphere was based on the, uh, the notion that you could take your cell phone and use it as a proxy for your identity. Um, and uh, it was based on the assumption that wherever your cell phone is, you are, and wherever you are, you're is your cell phone. And this has only recently become uh, practical because of the high correlation between you and your cell phone. It's become a very personal device. You carry it with you all the time. Um, if you were to leave, work, uh, leave your phone at home and go to work, you'd probably drive back and get it. If you went on a trip, you'd have it you know, couriered to wherever you were. It's that important in our lives. So on the basis of that, uh, we're able to uh, identify you uh, whenever there's a need to validate, verify, or authenticate against a internet or digital transaction. So let me give you an example. Um, if your credit card is being used in New York to buy something at Bloomingdale and your cell phone is in LA, you should know about that because that's probably uh, a theft that's occurring or a breach, a problem for sure, and should be investigated. Uh, the same thing occurs in the, um, in the card not present space. If you're having an online transaction and again, the IP address of uh, where the transaction is taking place is far enough away from where your cell phone is, then that's a problem as well. You can take a look at that from uh, social networking. If your profile is being changed, again, from an IP address that's far away, um, all the way to accessing a building. You know, if you have an employee that's entering a building in, in Munich, Germany, and their cell phone is not in Germany, you have a problem. Either it's a very unproductive employee or you've just had a breach uh, in your physical location. So what we do is we basically uh, work with uh, the banks and other enterprise operations and the wireless carriers to provide data so that we can make that type of an analysis. The concept is relatively easy. Uh, you can take a look at it at a consumer website we put up just so that you could take a look at it called uh, pinpoint-fraud.com. And um, so it's, a very, it's very simple that way in terms of a concept. Fortunately, it's very difficult to render. 
So we have quite, quite a bit of analytics behind what we do in order to render up a, uh, an opinion. And our opinion is usually given either as a risk score or an identity score or re recalibrating a score. And the reason we do that is to ensure that we have this double-blind methodology in terms of securing privacy for the individuals. So where this leads long-term is that uh, if you think about the number of companies, Google, Facebook, uh, Apple, trying to be your identity on the Internet, what we're trying to be is your identity security or your identity protection on the Internet. So that at consumer level, you have an awareness if your identity is being breached or somebody's using your, uh, you know, your financial resources or your social uh, background or any of the areas that you might participate in the Internet or, uh, or in that digital world. Okay, so here's a naive question. All the time I've got my cell phone with me, somebody knows where I am. Yeah, that's correct. In the wireless industry, and my background is a long time in wireless, um, the networks actually check in with the phone every, every five seconds or less. That's the same for all five billion phones on the planet. The information is housed in 5,000 databases that are distributed around the globe. So that's just how the system functions. The, the wireless carrier needs to know where the phone is in order to deliver a call when, everyone's, when anyone's trying to reach you. So the key element there is your cell phone number, and that, that location of that phone is always known at the uh, cell site level at a minimum. And what about those who would query the sort of, you know, the data protection stuff and uh, all this sort of stuff, the privacy angles and all those sorts of things? Sure. It's uh, at the uh, site that I mentioned, pinpoint-fraud, pinpoint for example, um, that's an opt-in model. So a lot of this can be opt-in because you want the privacy as the consumer. In the areas of uh, fraud detection, for example, during the commission of a, of a suspected crime, there are a lot of uh, waivers that are given in the regulation for fraud agents of the banks, for example, to, uh, to pursue the criminal and ensure that the, uh, the bank and you, the individual, don't lose money. Um, so that, that has been taken care of and, and anticipated in regulations. And in the bank's terms and conditions, for example, they talk about the number of things they can do in order to determine whether the transaction is fraudulent or not. And in that, I was, you know, I was new to that industry, and the amount of information that is passed between a bank and a fraud agent that they use is pretty amazing in terms of what I would consider very private information, in terms of your social security number, uh, an address where you might have lived, who you've worked for. There's just a, a very rich data that's shared among all of these fraud agents. In our case, we have very minimal amount of information that we require to render an opinion. We need the uh, zip code of the merchant where the uh, transaction occurred. We need the cell phone on record. And then all we do is render back an opinion and a score. So the uh, Deputy Information Commissioner in the UK, for example, calls our technology privacy enhancing because we can actually make an opinion on fraud with using a minimal amount of information. And a world improving business in the sense of um, saving us money on bank fraud, presumably. Sure, they're saving money on bank fraud. It turns out that just, you know, um, the banks only catch 35% of the fraud that occurs. Wow. And so the remainder is up to you. Uh, half the people, do, half of that is not captured, just in the way that people review their month end statements, which is not very detail oriented for most people. They do sort of, you know, hey, I spent 2,000 last month, I spent 2,000 this month. And um, they go up and down and see anything that's over $100, they verify. But, you know, though that's not the way fraud is rendered today in that particular space. It's rendered at the $20 level. It's, it's put on your card every second or third month. You can't see the pattern, and it's, you just pay it because you have a busy life. So there is quite a bit of money to be saved on that. And I think as the world goes more and more into the Internet and into the digital, digital world, that having awareness of how your information is being used, who's nibbling at the, at the edges, uh, who's actually taken over your, uh, your identity is something that you need to be very aware of. And I think the consumer is in the best place to be vigilant for themselves. So the only way to escape detection, live in a cave. Live in a cave would be the only way, which <laughs> for some might work, but for the vast majority, not an option. <laughs> Thank you. Andre, tell us about yourself. Uh, sure. Um, uh, I run a company called Synvenio Biosystems. Um, it is a uh, four-year-old uh, startup that originated uh, with some technology from the University of uh, California in Santa Barbara. Um, it is uh, a company focused on cancer uh, research, uh, specifically cancer diagnostics. Um, we are uh, particularly uh, focused on a, uh, uh, an aspect of cancer. We've, we uh, look for circulating tumor cells in the whole blood of, uh, of patients or 
hopefully in the future, uh, anybody at large, we hope to make this a broadly available diagnostic. Um, what I think is uh, uh, different about what we're doing, uh, obviously it's a, it's a game changer because it's designed to give uh, doctors a, uh, a look into the patients, give them a better understanding of the mechanistic side of the disease. Um, we are very focused on breast cancer because it is, uh, it is a model that we can work with. And um, we think we can prevent uh, or get a better jump on disease recurrence and ultimately give both the patients and the doctors uh, more information about a, a disease that, of course, everybody wants to uh, prevent or at least mitigate. I imagine it's a, it's a difficult thing, an expensive thing to, to, to finance. How's that being done? <laughs> yeah. So I thought you were going to ask me what keeps me awake at night. Uh, <laughs> and I would have said money, uh, as usual. Um, well, uh, it, it's, um, uh, sorry, I'm a little soft-spoken here, so they're turning up the mic. Uh, it, it's really, let me just step back for a second and explain how we got to this. Uh, uh, the company has, uh, was founded by two professors, Nobel Prize winner um, in physics, well, actually in chemistry for the year 2000, Alan Heger, and a materials and microfluidics expert, Professor So at uh, UCSB. So like uh, uh, a lot of technologies that originate in academia, they're fantastic, um, but they are general, and they need to be applied specifically. Uh, so they met um, the retired founder of McKinsey and Company towards the end of 2006, and they started focusing in on some areas. So our technology is very well suited for the detection of rare cells in general, in complex fluids and backgrounds. This could be uh, finding uh, viruses. This could be finding bacteria and other substances. We focused in on oncology and um, uh, circulating tumor cells in particular because it's a cousin of stem cells and these are rare cells and uh, researchers need access to these cells to be able to further their work. Um, the impetus, and I'm sure everybody in the room is aware of this and you'll hear uh, more of this today from Leroy Hood and other, uh, other uh, people like that, is uh, sequencing. So for sequencing to be effective, they need to obtain uh, the primary cells that they need to study so these DNA networks can be built. Uh, we, developed, we decided to develop the technology to obtain those rare cells and make them available to the, uh, uh, the industry that is now sequencing all this. So it's an enabling technology, and that in its own right is, uh, is important, uh, and I think it's a game changer. Now, to offer a return to shareholders, uh, you know, it's necessary to have more than an enabling technology. We have to have a solution. We have to have a product. And in this particular case, uh, the product that can be um, in envisaged is a diagnostic. So that takes time. It takes clinical trials. It takes a lot of collaborations. We're in the process of doing that. And that's why we're focused on what we call circulating tumor cells or, uh, or other cells of this type. And we're privately funded, to answer your question, <laughs> <laughs> in a roundabout way. We raised money from uh, 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 individuals. Uh, we do have uh, a venture um, investor in the group, but it's, uh, it's mostly a friends and family and uh, angel funded company. We've invested uh, $6 million to date. Um, I could give you some other parameters. We have a relationship with a large pharmaceutical company. Um, we have uh, also, as a way of financing ourselves, produced an OEM line of uh, uh, life science products that will launch next year and produce commercial revenue. Um, in 2009, we had very little revenue, $300,000. Uh, 2010, our revenues were $1.3 million. Uh, this year, they should be about $5 million. And next year, commercial products launch, and uh, we should you know, be able to double or triple that. I think the uh, monetization or the realization of the hope of what we're doing on the diagnostic side, after some trials with these partners, we'll start to see revenue for our shareholders in 2012, late 2012, 2013. Um, then how the company evolves, you know, we'll see. It's, we would like to make the technology broadly available. We would like it ultimately to be reviewed by people that work with the FDA. We would like it to be... Um, a general tool in oncology, and it's used both ultimately as a screen in a few years' time, but for now during drug development, and then we would like to use it as a uh, surveillance uh, service. We would like uh, companies to be able to monitor for the recurrence of disease. Sure. I'm sure it's a, a, a protracted um, a, a, a process, but, sorry, process. Um, but, uh, sorry, wrong schedule. But, uh, protract, yes, uh, banana, banana. Uh, protracted process. Um, but how soon before this actually, you know, could be making a difference, do you think? Well, it's making a difference now. We have tested uh, 500 patients last year. We had a lab at uh, UCLA, and uh, 
we saw that it works. So you always know this. You know that it works in your lab. You know that uh, the doctors that you're collaborating with are getting the results they need. And uh, our samples are being sequenced at companies like Illumina, um, Ion Torrent, which is now part of uh, Life Technologies. And uh, so uh, when is this going to be official is what you're asking me. Uh, you know, um, it could be next year, and it could be many years after that. I think it'll be used in a research mode for many years. Somebody, one of the guys asked me in the back, uh, you know, when are the clinical trials going to be finished? And I said, never. Uh, <laughs> they will never be finished. Um, the patients will be studied longitudinally. It'll be economically viable as a technology uh, this year. Uh, so that's one way to put it. I'd like to see it in the hands of, uh, of uh, doctors uh, also towards the end of this year. We have a collaboration uh, here in the Los Angeles area with the Breastlink organization. And uh, Dr. Uh, James Weissman is uh, doing a trial on 80 breast cancer patients. Um, and it's our own IRB, our own uh, uh, contract to arrange this. So um, it's, it's useful today. Um, and it will take several years for this to become a, an accepted uh, instrument. Um, or an accepted service, and it'll be brought to the market by other larger companies. Good luck to you. I wonder if I could just ask all of you, we've got about five minutes to go, um, just the difference that you hope what you're doing will make in a couple of sentences. Um, um, go for your life, Steve. What do you think? So I think the fundamental difference that, that we're bringing to the market is understanding <coughs> that the device is an important characteristic in how we um, authenticate, in the integrity of it, uh, we have an enormous problem that's out there. We, we have theft in an enormous scale. And, and a lot of the solutions that have been deployed to date have been ineffective at achieving that. And so this is a return to the basics. We do know how to do this. We do know how to build hardware security into the boxes. There's good news and bad news. The good news is we understand how to do it. The bad news, we have to replace all the PCs in the world. And so now it's your turn. Um, we're at a half a billion machines. Most people haven't turned them on yet. Turn them on. So I'll use an example. 85% or more of all national health systems in UK have a common mechanism for access control to electronic health record, but they haven't turned it on. So that's an interesting Why? context. Why? Because it's just reaching a point. So we just got CESG guidance in February of this year that as an information assurance capability, this was legitimate to turn on in Her Majesty's government. So these things take time. It's a little bit like I mean, you're all happy with your cereal mouse. Her Majesty's been a bit busy ports. recently. We've had a wedding, you know. I mean, well, yeah. yes, but you know the wedding's over, so it's time to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Kick the corgis out and get down to it. Um, uh, Paul. Well, when I was a kid, I was convinced that we'd be flying to work every day, right? We'd, we'd be manning other planets by now. The, the rate of innovation would be far exceeding where it is. Uh, we've done some tremendous things as a society, but I think you're going to see over the next 50 years, the rate and the velocity of innovation is going to increase exponentially. And a large part of that is going to be through tools like ours that allow collective intelligence, really understanding the world is flat, there's experts all over, we have to mine that talent, get them together with their passions, and really uh, create incredible innovation. So I think that it's going to be a very exciting time over the next 50 years. Fabulous. Thank you. Alfred. Well, you know, um, one other thing I really wish to happen to see is something very simple. Today, uh, for just about any, every industry and every type of worker, they have very specialized tools to get their work done, construction worker, electrician. But for most of the knowledge worker, when they show up at work, we literally give them no tools other than your PC, Microsoft desktop and a browser, we give no specialized tool to do the most specialized work. And you look at what the consumer gets today and the level of you know, specialized tool we're giving to the consumer, whether it's for entertainment, for connecting with your friends, they're almost to a point that they're almost astonishingly incredible, right? And how we're communicating with people. These technology has to come into the workplace now. If in the next two years, we can make a you know, very sustainable and substantial impact into making these tools available to knowledge worker, the world will be such a better place, would be so much more effective, we will have so much more leisure time and allocated everyone, we will generate so many more jobs. This is something that just has to be done. So um, that would be my wish. 
Nicely said, Mike. Yeah, I think that uh, consumers need to protect themselves uh, in this uh, digital age uh, and on the internet, and that I think that using their mobile as something that can help protect their identity, where they uh, set it up once, it runs in the background, uh, it's non-intrusive, it's pervasive, it works on any phone, any place on the planet, and uh, and you, you're protected. So we'd like to change the you know the notion of mobility or mobile identity protection using mobile as both a noun and a verb. So that yes, your phone as a noun protects you. So if you have it with you, it protects you. And as a verb, it follows you around. So you're protected no matter where you go. And I think that's the type of confidence consumers need in the services that are coming forward in order to ensure that their privacy and their identity is uh, is remains uh, you know, protected. Thank you, Andre. Well, uh, so for me, uh, you know, there's the obvious benefit of cancer diagnostics. That implies a lot of things. But if I could be a little bit more specific and what I could wish for, um, you know, I could wish for nobody to wake up and be told by their doctor that they have a mass somewhere in their body the size of a, of a lemon. And, you know, that can be avoided. And I would like this to be um, uh, information generally accessible to the patient as well as their physician with a simple blood draw or something non-invasive, something not complicated. And um, I, uh, as a third wish, I want to accelerate the work of all the other researchers that are sequencing things and building these systemic models so that they can ultimately change the way this disease is, uh, is dealt with, you know, something more than radiation and, uh, and surgery, because it really hasn't changed in uh, not just uh, 20 or 30 years. It, you know, a lot of the disease hasn't changed in hundreds of years, so I want to accelerate all that. Great, sir. Gentlemen, thank you very much. These are the fire starters. Thank you. Congratulations. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you, David.